for inviting me to, to speak to you all. Uh, Elaine and I were chatting uh, beforehand, and I was thinking of my experience uh, back when I was in law school in the Stone Age, back in 1998. And uh, I, I've always been interested in originalism, and where I really first became uh, interested enough to want to pursue it for the subsequent 22 years was I took my first constitutional law class. And some of you are in constitutional law, some of you may have had Professor Barnett. And I don't know what your experience is like. I suspect it's different than mine. Mine, I think, was and is probably still still uh, fairly uh, generalizable, which is I was stunned to see that uh, we uh, read uh, uh, about 100 percent of our time on Supreme Court opinions about what the Constitution meant and about zero percent of our time about what the Constitution actually said or its text or its structure or its history. And, uh, and so that put me on, on a goal to see, well, is there more information than just what the Supreme Court says? And one of the ways in which I tried to, to gather that information, because back in the, in the bad old days of the 90s, uh, when originalism was not really a thing, unlike today with uh, Judge Barrett's Supreme Court confirmation hearings, uh, where originalism is a thing, and some people think it's great, some people think it's bad, um, one of the ways that I would be able to find out more about originalism was I would invite speakers in through the Federal Society and Professor Barnett was somebody who I invited uh, back way back in 1999, and he had either he had just published or it was in the draft process of being published uh, his his first major article on originalism, which was an originalist an originalism for non originalists, and it was his uh, it was semi autobiographical. It was him describing he had been a originalism skeptic and how he became an originalist. And then you see that fully fleshed out in his really important book, Restoring the Lost Constitution from a few years later. And so it was great because I had Professor Barnett come in. Uh, he did a debate against one of my kind of law professors. I thought he won hands down. But even more important was I had all these questions that I had been storing up uh, in my constitutional law class that my professor just didn't really care about. And when I did ask some of them, I didn't think that the answers were, um, that they were satisfactory, in part because I don't think the professor was just sympathetic, like those questions are lame. And so I, I, was, I had a chance to ask Professor Barnett all these questions. So the poor guy I picked him up from the airport and I'm sure he was thinking, this guy's asking a lot of questions. So I, on the way back to the airport, on the way from the airport, and, I, and I was, it, was, it was great because uh, I had all these thoughts uh, stored up and some of them I could tell uh, were clearly not sound ideas. And he had really powerful responses that I thought, well, that's not, I'm not gonna pursue that anymore. But then there were other things that, that he seemed to, to be open to and thought those were sound ideas. And, uh, and so originalism has been the, the continued pursuit from that first class where we just didn't talk about the Constitution's text at all. And so one of the neat things about the center is that you all get the opportunity to have, I, I saw your list of speakers, which is amazing, uh, lots of different aspects of originalism, lots of different things that are core of originalism, uh, some on the periphery of originalism. And I would just have loved to have that opportunity when I was a student uh, 22 years ago. And in fact, I was at the center uh, as a fellow, as a faculty fellow uh, back in 2015, I think it was. And the first draft of this book was written while I was a faculty fellow there. And it was, it was great to have uh, Professor Barnett and Professor Larry Solom was there at the time uh, to work with and, and ask questions about as I was, I was working through it. So I'm looking forward to uh, kind of being back at the center, at least virtually, so to speak. And so Elena, you had said for me to speak for maybe 25 minutes or so, and then open it up for Q&A, is that right? That's right. Okay. Yeah, and I'm looking forward to everybody's questions and comments. I'm going to start maybe with, with what may seem kind of odd to you. And how many of you have experienced this, this uh, situation? You're driving along, it's a divided four-lane highway, and you're, you're, you're in a traffic jam. And then you look in your passenger mirror, and you see some guy pull off on the side onto the shoulder, and you know he's going to like speed by you. So I've experienced that on a couple of occasions. In fact, one time when I was doing a draft of this talk, which relies on, you'll see the argument I'm going to make, somebody did that to me, and I actually took a picture of it and used it uh, in the talk that I was there. And if you're like me, when you see that person pulling out, uh, what, do you, what do you think about that person? I think that person's not a good person. Or what do you say about that person? Sometimes if my kids aren't in the car, uh, they'll even be like some choice words that utter from my mouth. And uh, what, I'm, what, I'm, what I'm trying to describe is, uh, a situation where you have somebody who uh, is uh, violating the law, but at least at first blush doesn't appear to be hurting anybody else. And in fact, if you were to ask the driver, hey, what are you doing, buddy? He could, he could reasonably say, I'm getting to my destination in a more efficient manner. So, so there's a good that comes out of this and nobody else is worse off. 
And what I'm going to argue today is that this aggr aggressive driver it acted unethically. And it's not because driving on the pavement's inherently unethical, it's because he acted illegally. He broke the law. And in doing so, my argument's going to be the aggressive driver harmed both himself and his fellow citizens because he took for himself an opportunity that the legal system had not allocated to him, which is just a passenger car driving, but instead had said was reserved for emergency vehicles or, or emergencies only. So how does that relate to the Constitution? What I'm gonna argue is that just like our aggressive driver who hurt himself and his fellow citizens by violating the law, a federal judge who misinterprets the Constitution, who doesn't use originalism, also hurts himself and the judge's fellow citizens. So that's gonna be the, the bird to my argument today. So this afternoon, I'm going to uh, describe what I think are the three main contributions from originalism's promise to originalist theory. And my impression is that many of you have already been introduced to originalism, so I'm not gonna describe originalism in a general way. I'm just gonna talk about what are the three, I think, most important contributions of this book to originalist theory. And, and here are the, the three. First, I'm gonna talk about my originalist theory of precedent, which has been a longstanding area of controversy and debate within originalism. Second, I'm going to talk about my theory of judicial virtue, so the kind of characteristics that judges need to have in order to be excellent originalist judges. And then third, and this is really the, the I think the key payoff of the book, is my natural law justification for originalism. As Elena, I said, I'm going to speak for about 25 minutes. A lot of things I can't talk about. I'm happy to, I'm looking forward to our conversation because uh, both about questions or comments or criticisms of what I'm going to say but also things maybe that I wasn't able to cover in our, in our time. And on my faculty webpage, I've got a whole bunch of, uh, of my articles that are online, uh, just as one example. Uh, one of the articles, and it's part of the book as well, is about how does originalism respond to the challenge of changed social circumstances? And you can go there and download those for free uh, in, in your spare time. You know, we were talking before, just mentioning before that this is uh, another time of confirmation hearings. And, uh, back in 1998, originalism was really exotic, that most law schools didn't have an originalist scholar. Uh, originalism on the Supreme Court was uh, relatively rare. You had two justices, Scalia and Thomas, who had articulated originalism to some degree. But today, it's a different story, uh, both on the, the, uh, the uh, Amy, Amy Coney Barrett confirmation hearings. But my favorite, uh, this was a couple years ago, of course, when Justice Gorsuch was being uh, confirmed, that uh, Cosmo, which is an art, a magazine I do not read, I don't know anything about it, to be honest with you, uh, but, but somebody had sent it to me and I thought to myself, if Cosmo is writing about originalism, originalism has really kind of come a long way, baby. And so this is really the best time to be an originalist, at least since the New Deal. So my three steps this afternoon is I'm gonna explain originalism and my, my unique contribution, which is the theory of precedent. Second, I'm going to describe the natural law tradition and with its two key facets, one is natural law and one is virtue ethics. And then second, I'm going to apply that natural law tradition to the American Constitution and argue that originalism is the best theory of interpretation. First, natural law requires positive law to secure the common good of American society and individual human flourishing. The Constitution is our society's positive law means to secure the common good, and originalism is the meaning that allows the Constitution to achieve that positive law, natural law outcome of, of securing the common good. And then second, virtue ethics is necessary to help judges become excellent judges who can, who can help the machine of originalism, help the enterprise of originalism stay true to its principles uh, and, uh, and pursue the common good. So originalism arose in the early 1970s uh, in response to the excesses of the Warren and Burger courts. Judge Bork was an early figure. This is him from his confirmation hearings uh, back in the 1980s. Uh, today, originalism uh, has a lot of different flavors out there. Uh, the, the, the version of originalism that I advocate is called public meaning originalism, and it's the most common version of originalism. I'm going to talk about a few other versions as we go along. When you think of a public meaning originalism, it's the public meaning of the text when it was ratified is the, is the authoritative meaning. And uh, be, because I think you've probably been exposed to originalism in, in this fashion enough, I'm not going to go into detail about how one uncovers the original meaning, although I'm certainly happy to talk about it, and, and, and the first part of my book does go into detail. I think that the kind of neat thing about my description of originalism when it comes to original meaning or original intent or original understanding or original methods is that I, as, I'm, as I argue that substantively, 
from the perspective of the Constitution as a mechanism of communication, which is my perspective, is the natural law perspective of the Constitution, that those different versions of originalism aren't distinct. They're just looking at different facets to the originalist communicative enterprise. And I'm happy to talk about that as well. If you're looking for, I think, a, an example of where originalism has really done well, um, one of my favorite examples, and this is one that I came across actually in law school and that I've been looking re repeatedly at as a scholar, is the, is the debate over the original meaning of the Commerce Clause. And Professor Barnett has a series of three articles, uh, one from 2001, one from 2003, and the one from 2012, where he goes through uh, different uh, tools to evaluate the Constitution's original meaning. So if you're looking for a place to see how it's done well, I think you look at those three articles and you get a good rounded picture of it. And in particular, I think the second article, the one from 2003, is really interesting because there Professor Barnett uses, I think, the newest tool uh, he was using in 2003, but originals have been uh, now bringing it to the fore over the last couple of years, called corpus linguistics, which is computer-assisted research techniques. And he does, he uses that, uh, this, it's the first use of it, actually, uh, back in 2003. So as I said, I'm not going to go into detail on this topic about how you do originalism, but I'm going to spend my time on this part of description talking about my originalist theory of precedent. So I've talked just briefly about original meaning originalism, but critics could reasonably ask, ours is a common law system in which star decisis plays a really prominent role. And so far, I haven't said anything about, about star decisis, and it doesn't seem like there's a place for star decisis in the description that I've given. I haven't said anything about precedent. And in fact, critics have plausibly argued that originalism's commitment to following the original meaning means that originalism's adoption would, would require overruling a lot of non-originalist precedent with resulting instability. So you'd have all this legal instability and harm to reliance interests. And I think one of the most powerful examples is the legal tender cases. They are a series of cases after the Civil War where the Supreme Court said that under Article I, Section 8, uh, the power to coin money, that clause, that that included the power to make legal tender paper money. Um, I think that the best interpretation of, of the power to coin money actually means that Congress only has the power to create metallic tokens because of the reasons at the time, which we don't need to go into here. And so if you assume that that's correct, and that legal tender cases, therefore, are non-originalist precedents, then a critic could argue, I mean, we need to overrule the legal tender cases, and that the paper money in the United States and around the world is illegal and therefore of no value. That would be dramatically destabilizing. That's the critic's perspective. And really, to make matters worse, Justice Thomas pictured here, I think metaphorically saying stop to star decisis in uh, the uh, Gamble case, the uh, Gamble versus U.S. case from last year, issued a concurrence where he said with a, with a, with a small caveat, originalism requires overruling all non-originalist precedent. And in fact, that's the view, I would say, of a substantial minority of originalist scholars out there. And it has, it has a lot to commend it, otherwise it wouldn't be the view of a substantial minority of scholars. But that's not my view. It's not the one I defend in my book. So what I argue in the book is that originalism actually requires significant respect for precedent, both originalist and non-originalist, and so that there's a privileged place for precedent within originalism. And I, I make that argument because I argue that the Constitution itself, its original meaning itself, requires federal judges to give significant respect to precedent. Well, where's that come from? It comes from Article Three, the judicial power that federal judges exercise. And in the book, and in some previous scholarship, I went through the historical evidence, starting back in Merry Old England, colonial America, revolutionary America, the framing ratification, and then post-ratification practice by the federal courts. And what I described was the widespread understanding, in other words, the public meaning, that judicial power includes a requirement of giving significant respect to precedent. And I'll just give you one data point out of a whole bunch. During the run-up to the adoption of the Constitution, you all know that there were the Anti-Federalists don't adopt the Constitution, and the Federalists adopt the Constitution. And Brutus, one of the most prominent Anti-Federalists, was focusing on Article 3. It was, it, was, it was Letter 15, I think. And what he said was, we don't want to adopt this Article 3 because you'll have federal judges who will interpret the Constitution capaciously. In other words, give the federal government uh, more power than it actually deserves, put that in a precedent, and then in the next case, refer to the precedent, expand it a little bit more. And he taught, what he basically described was what we today would call precedential drift over time. But the premise of his criticism, which he didn't defend, is that federal judges would create and be bound by constitutional precedent. 
But on the flip side, Alexander Hamilton writing in Federalist, uh, I think it was Federalist, Federalist uh, 78, I think that's the one, um, he was responding to Burgess's argument and he made lemonade out of those lemons. His argument was, you're right, he didn't, he didn't defend the premise, he assumed, just like Brutus, that federal judges would create uh, non-originalist precedent and precedent, uh, originalist precedent and be bound by it. But he said that was a good thing because star decisis is valuable for the rule of law and we want judges to make a lot of precedent. But the key point is that on both sides, they, they used as a premise for other arguments the assumption that federal judges would create and be bound by non-originalist precedent. So then what I argue is in the book that Federal judges have this commitment to precedent. And what that means is that when they face a, an originalist precedent, they need to follow it. So if you look on the left-hand side of this very simplified originalist decision tree, on the top is, is there a precedent? Yes. Is the precedent originalist? The answer is yes, then you follow it. And, and so uh, a, a, an originalist precedent is a precedent that correctly interpreted and applied the Constitution. And if that's what a new judge, if that's what a federal judge is facing, then the federal, federal judge is required by judicial power to follow it. Now, what if the precedent's non-originalist? What I argue is that when a federal judge is faced with a non-originalist precedent, the judge has to take into account three uh, variables, three factors. The first factor is how much of a deviation is this precedent from the original meaning? So if it's a great deviation, that puts pressure on the judge to overrule it. Second, would overruling the precedent harm rule of law values? So if it's like the legal tender cases, that would be a, it'd be a strong reason to not overrule the precedent because of the dramatic harm to rule of law values. Third, and I think this is most, most controversially, most controversial, I'm happy to talk about why I included this factor, is the precedent, even though it's incorrect, just? And so judges will be taking into account their own conception of what's just and using that to evaluate whether to follow or not follow a non-originalist precedent. So the key payoff here is that unlike what critics argue, and I think unlike, frankly, what Justice Thomas argues, the first question that a federal judge should ask in every case is, is there precedent? So, so originalism on this conception is very precedent focused. And one of the reasons why I think that's valuable is because, as you know from being in law school, precedent's the name of the game in the American legal practice. We do that all the time. And if you had a theory of interpretation that paid no attention to that or tried to exclude some huge chunk of that, that would be really problematic. Okay, so I've talked a little bit about how we do originalism. I spent some time on the theory of originalist precedent. Now let me spend some time and move over to my natural law justification for originalism, but let me set the table. There are currently, I think, four main arguments out there for why we should do originalism. And I'm just gonna list them here. I'm not gonna defend them or explain them. Happy to talk about them later because of time constraints. The first one is popular sovereignty. Keith Whittington from Princeton first articulated this argument. And the basic idea is that if we consistently follow originalism, the American people's popular sovereignty will be enhanced. Second, good consequences. This comes from John McGinnis and Mike Rappaport in their book, The Good Constitution, which is an excellent book. And they argue that because of the Article 5 amendment process and the initial adoption process, which requires supermajorities, that the resulting original meaning is going to be good and lead to good consequences. Third is natural rights. This comes from Professor Barnett in his, in his awesome book, Restoring the Lost Constitution. And he argues that the original meaning is very rights protective. And so therefore, if federal judges follow it, if we follow original meaning, then we'll have robust protection for natural rights. The last one, original law originalism is new. I would say a couple of years old now. And this is a, this is a creative argument. Um, and what these scholars argue is that they make two moves. First, originalism is our law. That if you look at the, at the legal system the right way, if you look at its fundamental commitments, if you look at what judges really say, you see that despite cases like Wicked versus Philbird, or um, uh, um, depending on your perspective, Roe versus Wade and other cases, originalism really is our law that's governing most of what the Supreme Court does. And then the second part of the move, and this is why it's a, also a normative justification, is that because federal officials like judges take an oath to support the Constitution, that's the normative justification for why judges should follow originalism. It's our law, and they take an oath to support the law, therefore they're taking an oath to support originalism. 
Now, of course, I haven't defended any of these views. I'm going to defend my own view in a second. But what these scholars are trying to answer is the question, which I'm also trying to answer, which is, why should we follow the original meaning if it leads to a bad result? Or why can't the original meaning just be one factor among many that judges use in their interpretive calculus? What these scholars are arguing is that when you follow the original meaning, you get more popular sovereignty, better consequences, uh, more protection for natural rights, or faithfulness to one's oath. Now, these are the arguments that, that these originalists are giving. So what I'm going to do is move over to my justification for originals, which I think is the key contribution of this book. What I'm going to do first is summarize the natural law tradition and then apply it to the Constitution. So the natural law tradition, it's huge. And there's lots of different views about it. There's, there's conflicting views about it. I think there's caricatures of it. So don't be surprised if some of my description today doesn't fit with, with what you've heard maybe in the past. The natural law tradition has its origin in Greek thought. Uh, it was given mature form by Thomas Aquinas in the Middle Ages. And in the Anglo-American world, John Finnis at Oxford, Robert George at Princeton, and many other scholars have advocated for, defined, and explained natural law tradition in the Anglo-American legal system. The natural law tradition has a lot of different aspects. I'm going to just focus on two. One is natural law and one is virtue ethics. Natural law and virtue ethics are two tools, two mechanisms, two means by which we are guided towards our end, which is human happiness or flourishing. And so the goal of both natural law and virtue ethics is to help us achieve human happiness. And these two mechanisms exist because of our nature, because of the kind of beings that we are, not regardless of our time period we live in, regardless of our religion, of our race, of our class, of our gender, the claim by natural lawyers is that these natural law components apply to us just because, and, be, and because we're human. Natural law is an external guide, it's a rule to help us uh, achieve happiness. And virtue ethics, as I'm gonna describe, is an internal inclination. It's a type of character that helps us achieve our happiness. So let me first talk about natural law. Natural law is a collection of laws, of rules and principles that guide us to happiness. They tell us what actions will make us happy and what actions will make us unhappy. And they're natural because they apply to us as human beings with a human body and, a, and depending on your perspective, a human soul. And so different laws would apply to us if we have different natures. So one of the natural law norms is to uh, engage in a reasonable amount of leisure. So take leisure time. And that applies to us because we have a kind of uh, facility, a human body that requires rest in order to recuperate. And these natural laws are laws because they direct, they instruct us to uh, do certain things and avoid other things. They instruct us to do good things and avoid certain bad things. And these good things are called basic human goods. They're, they include things like life and friendship and leisure and knowledge. They're the things that make life worth living. And the natural law says that we should pursue those things and don't pursue their opposites. You're studying law at Georgetown, and the fundamental reason you're studying law at Georgetown is because Georgetown law provides you with a basic human good called knowledge. So let me ask you to step back for a moment and reflect on your own reasoning process. What I'm trying to describe is the basic human goods are the answers you give yourself when you ask yourself, why am I doing something? So why are you doing this? Why are you taking Professor Barnett's constitutional law course? Because of the basic human good of knowledge. And there's a faculty of our minds called practical reason that allows us to see these basic human goods. And I think for those of you who are parents, you're probably most of you are too young to be a parent. I'm a parent. And when you ask a parent, in fact, I'm just a parent. Uh, our newest child is a month old. So as a new parent, you're thinking of, all the dreams that you have for your child. And if you ask a parent, what do you want for your child? The answers that parents give are the things I'm talking about. They want life and leisure and friends and happiness. Those are the good things that make life worth living. Now compare that to something that's not a basic human good, money. Money isn't a basic human good because it's not an end in itself. It doesn't make humans happy, but it is a means to human good. And what was wrong with Ebenezer Scrooge, the person pictured on the right, that's an older uh, version of Ebenezer Scrooge, was that he wanted money for its own sake. He thought, he acted like it was a basic human good. And he put aside friendship with his nephew, Fred, which is a basic human good. And he put aside health of his employee son, Tiny Tim, which itself is a basic human good as well. And what was right with George Bailey? George Bailey, of course, is the person on the left. The Strang kids have to suffer through watching him every Christmas. What was right with George Bailey was that he put aside money and many other things for the good of friendship with his family and with his community. Those, those basic human goods are the things that the natural law directs us to pursue. 
The second key component of the natural law tradition is virtue ethics. While the natural law provides external guidance, pursue these goods, avoid their opposite, the virtue ethics provides us with descriptions about what kind of character, what kind of people we need to be to be able to pursue those goods effectively. And because of time constraints, I'm just gonna offer two examples to, to explain this concept. So one of the virtues is temperance. And temperance is using material goods in a reasonable amount. And uh, if you're like me, uh, sadly, you probably have a family member or friend that you know of who maybe drinks to excess or uses some material substance to excess. And that intemperance is doubly bad. It's doubly bad because not only does it harm them from whatever the excess of that good is, let's say drinking and becoming drunk, but it harms them because it also prevents them from pursuing the other things that really are good in life. So drinking may be good or bad, um, but it's not fundamentally good like friendship. Or think about judging. And so I'm gonna talk about this a little bit later, that there are particular virtues that judges have. We call them the judicial virtues that make judges and judging excellent. And one of them is theoretical wisdom. So the intellectual firepower of a judge to be able to accurately describe uh, a case and the, and, the, and the law governing it. So think about, for example, uh, most of you have had property law probably, and maybe you've had the takings clause. So, so if, you, if you have, you'll know this case, and if you haven't, you'll cover this case. It's a case called Kelo versus New London, Connecticut, and it dealt with what's called the public use clause of the Fifth Amendment takings clause. And the Fifth Amendment limits uh, takings for, quote, a public use. And there's a debate about what public use means in, in American law. And there's also been a debate about what it means, what its original meaning was. And Justice Thomas in dissent in the Kelo case, I thought uh, it provided an excellent example of theoretical wisdom, that he had mastered the original meaning of the public use clause through the text, through the structure, through the history, and then also through the subsequent originalist and non-originalist precedent. He was able to put that all together in an elegant synthesis. That's an example of, I think, theoretical wisdom for judges. So what I've done so far in my natural law argument is I've described the natural law tradition very briefly, natural law and virtue ethics, and both are aimed at human happiness. And I'm going to now apply that tradition to our constitution. So my core claim this afternoon is that the natural law tradition leads to an originalist interpretation of our constitution because originalism leads to the common good of American society, and the conditions for which us as individuals are able to pursue our own individual human flourishing. And I'm gonna try and establish this through a two-step move. First, look at law generally, and then second, apply to the Constitution. So first, law generally. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, uh, in the natural law tradition, uh, human flourishing is when we live full, happy human lives, and I described how we do that through natural law and virtue ethics. But the law plays an important role, and that's gonna be the burden of my remarks here positive law should encourage human flourishing. And a society whose positive law encourages human flourishing is one that's better than one that doesn't. So for example, uh, a society that has laws prohibiting arbitrary barriers to access to education, the basic human good of knowledge, like racial barriers, is better than one that doesn't. Human flourishing can only occur if positive law and legal authority overcome what are called coordination problems. Coordination problems are the obstacles to the social cooperation that's necessary for us to be able to pursue our own basic goods. So let's step back for a second and think about all the things that we do together that involve cooperation, that it's so deeply ingrained in us that I think we often don't see it. I'm gonna use the example of highway regulations. Uh, so highway regulations uh, involve a complex set of interactions that is law directed and law governed. And I'll give you two examples. So one comes from the signs that you see on your slide. These are from, from Chile. My wife and I went to Chile a couple years ago, and some of the signs on the left, I got that one, right? The red octagon, I know what it means. But the one on the right, didn't know what that meant. And so it made it hard for me to coordinate with the other Chilean drivers who knew what that sign meant. And so uh, the law, through the, through the mechanism of the signs, uh, was coordinating the Chilean drivers, but wasn't coordinating this, this American guy down there. Another example, uh, one of my sons just became 16. Um, I was teaching him how to drive. Many of you probably remember those days when your parents were teaching you how to drive. We pulled up to a four-way stop. Uh, we were uh, the right driver, the right-hand driver, and the other, there was another driver who pulled up about simultaneously with us. My son didn't know what to do. He didn't know what the law was. He didn't know what the rule was that if two people pull up to the stop sign, the people, the person on the right goes first. And so my son sat there, the other person just sat there, the other person was getting mad, and my son didn't know what to do because he didn't know the law and therefore wasn't able to cooperate 
with the person next to us. So driving occurs all the time, but it has, it has beneath it this really deep cooperation that's law governed and law guided that we don't, we don't even recognize normally. And the, and the coordination problems only increase as the complexity of the good increases. So think about the good of educating young people. A community's education of its young people is, is, a, is a complex process. And so the law governing it, the law coordinating how we do that as a community, as a society, is, cor is correspondingly more complex. Okay, so the, how, does, how does the natural law tradition overcome these coordination problems? The natural law tradition says that positive law is the essential tool to overcome coordination problems. And it does so through authoritative, prudential, social ordering decisions. So think of highway regulations. We know that the person on the right is supposed to go first because in our jurisdiction, the state legislature or the Department of Transportation has a statute or rule, that's law, that says that the person on the right goes first. There's an authoritative decision maker. Second, the decisions are prudential. There's not one right answer to most of these questions. So should the person on the right go first or the person on the left? Should people drive on the right-hand side of the road or the left? Should the speed limit be 55 or 65 or 45? There's not one right answer, but the legal decision maker uses his or her prudential judgment to make an all things considered best decision. Third, the decisions coordinate members of society that, the, that, that my son, once he learned what the law was from me, was able to coordinate his activities with the other driver. And these decisions then allow people to cooperate and overcome coordination problems. These authoritative prudential social ordering decisions, they're legal decisions, because they overcome coordination problems, allow cooperation, and allow people to pursue their human flourishing are the, uh, best, uh, are the best ways uh, for us to be able to pursue our flourishing. And every person in a community is obliged to follow these decisions because they allow us to flourish. So let's step back and think, what would a practically reasonable person think about the law? And my claim here is that if you're practically reasonable, if you're trying to act reasonably, you're trying to pursue your own basic human goods, you're going to see that the legal system is a necessary component both for your own and your fellow citizens' human flourishing. And so let's go back to our aggressive driver. So the aggressive driver pulls on the side, did not follow the law's coordination, and spread, sped past. My claim is that the aggressive driver hurt him or herself and hurt him or her fellow citizens. So the driver hurt himself because he harmed his own participation in fundamental basic human goods of practical reasonableness, justice, and civic friendships. Parts of his own human flourishing, he actually hurt. So let's, let me give you an example. Civic friendship. Civic friendship is the virtue where people in a community wish the best for other people in the community. And that's a, that's a we th typically think of that as citizenship, so that, that even if you don't know somebody, somebody maybe is a, not, not a, not, not, is a stranger to you, the fact that they're fellow Americans or here, fellow Buckeyes, or uh, I, I mean, out in the country, fellow Richfield Township centerers means that I should at least will the best for them. It doesn't mean I need to go out of my way to help them, but I should have a disposition to, to help them. And if you are like me, when you see the driver pull on the shoulder and you think ill of that person, you think that person's an a-hole, that's your judgment. I think it's an accurate judgment. That person is acting badly and is therefore hurting himself because he's not acting in your interest, the other driver's interest. He's putting himself first above all other drivers and above emergency vehicles. But the driver also hurts his fellow citizens and himself indirectly because the driver undermines the legal system and that provides the coordination that he needs to flourish. So what's your second thought when you see the driver pulling be, be, uh, alongside you? First thought is, he shouldn't be doing that. Second thought is, I'm gonna do that, right? Because that guy's getting where he wants to go. I wanna get where I wanna go. And what you see is that the, the, the cooperation, the coordination breaks down quickly once people start peeling away and stop co cooperating. Fourth step, this is where originalism enters the picture. Originalism is necessary uh, for people to understand what these authoritative prudential social ordering decisions are. The legal authority has to communicate his or her decision effectively, to, has to communicate legal reasons to the citizens to be able to coordinate their activities. So think of the Chilean speed limit signs or other signs as well. That when I was in Chile, I was unable to cooperate with the fellow Ch with, my other, with the other Chileans because I didn't know what the, the signs meant. And so I, there was a miscommunication. It was on me at that point, of course, but 
The goal is to have the legal system's reasons uh, communicated so everybody can co coordinate. And that understanding of law as communication is an originalist understanding. So let's turn to the Constitution. The Constitution, I argue, is our, author our society's solution to fundamental coordination problems. How many branches of government will we have? What, Congress, what powers will Congress have? How long should the president's term of office be? There's not one right answer to any of those questions, but we have to have an answer to all of those questions and many more to have a properly functioning legal system. So our constitution was adopted through means recognized as authoritative. So for those of you who've been to the National Archives, uh, the constitution's up there up front, uh, it's, a, it's a document lying under glass. It's our constitution, not because it's the most beautiful document, uh, it's actually pretty faded, you can barely read it now, not because it's the most normatively attractive document. I think most of us think that at least some parts, maybe many parts, are at least imprudent and maybe unjust. I certainly have that view. The only reason why it's our constitution is because it and only it went through the process by which Americans then and today recognize as identifying our constitution. That's the framing and ratification process. Second, the constitution is the result of numerous prudential judgments. So when you think about the president's term of office, there's not one right answer to how long that term of office should be. Uh, and the framers really grappled with that. So on the one hand, they knew that they didn't want somebody with life tenure. That was the king that didn't work out. On the other hand, they knew they didn't want an executive officer with a really short term of office because when you looked at the uh, independent state governors who typically had a one-year term of office, they had no independence from the legislature and the legislature was basically just overawing them. And so four years wasn't all things considered judgment long enough to be somewhat independent of Congress, but not too long to be independent of the American people. Third, the Constitution coordinated and continues to coordinate members of our society today. All officers take an oath to the Constitution. All officers, when they act pursuant to the Constitution, or I'm sorry, when they act, claim that they are acting pursuant to the Constitution. And when you think about different provisions of the Constitution, the Constitution, uh, its text, and for, for a large part, although not exclusively anymore, its original meaning coordinates Americans today. So think of the Commerce Clause. The Commerce Clause was authorized, I'm sorry, was instituted to authorize Congress to prevent interstate trade disputes, which Congress is able to do uh, today. So here's where originalism enters the picture. Originalism is necessary to understand the Constitution's authoritative, prudential, social ordering decisions. Let me give an example. Article 4, Section 4, allows the federal government to intervene in the affairs of states in instances of domestic violence. Uh, if we were using originalism, I'm sorry, if we weren't using originalism, we would see that the federal government could intervene using a conventional meaning today, I think basically all of the time because of the unfortunate uh, 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 huge amount of spousal abuse, which is a, a synonym today for domestic violence. But that's not what the framers and ratifiers had judged. Instead, they had created a fine-tuned prudential federalism balance. On the one hand, we love federalism, so states do your own thing. On the other hand, federalism isn't worth a candle if the governments in the states are being overcome through insurrection or rebellion or using their term, domestic violence. So originalism gives us access to that fine-tuned authoritative prudential social ordering decision in a way that a living constitutionalist uh, view would not. So let's turn to judges. Like our aggressive driver that we mentioned earlier, judges have sound reasons to follow the Constitution's original meaning. So let's say that we had a judge who, who says this. We can forget about much of the 18th century and much of the Constitution's text. With respect to contemporary constitutional issues, a judge should ask what is a sensible response. I take that to be a non-originalist, living constitutionalist theory of interpretation. And in fact, it's kind of interesting, uh, the, the judge who said this, who I'm not gonna say who it is, uh, actually had said this at an event where the judge was giving a review of Professor Barnett's newest book, um, uh, our, our, our Republican Constitution, right, right, Elena? Our Republican Constitution is his newest one. And, um, and then the judge kind of went off on a tangent, just saying original and basically stunk, and then had this quote, which I was able to capture. And uh, I was kind of stunned that he said that, because usually judges don't say that publicly, at least, uh, but, the, but the judge did so. So my claim is that a judge who has that view of his or her job is both harming himself and harming his fellow citizens. So first, a judge who fails to utilize originalism like this judge would harm his own capacity to flourish. And I'll give you just one reason. I mentioned earlier the, the judicial virtues. 
one of the judicial virtues is the virtue of justice as lawfulness. It's the, I think it's the paradigm example of when we think of a judge, what do judges do? They follow the law. We don't go to the Supreme Court because we think they're the ethically best judges ever. We don't go to the Supreme Court because we think that they have the best science or the best math or anything. We go to them because they are supposed to be articulating what the law is. And justice as lawfulness is the character of a judge to follow the law. Now, think of the case uh, Home Building and Loan versus Blaisdell, which those of you who've had constitutional law will have covered. It was a New Deal, I'm sorry, it was a New Deal Great Depression case where Minnesota had passed a moratorium on the foreclosure of mortgages. In other words, it was, it was preventing banks from enforcing their contracts. And that was, that was challenged under the Contracts Clause, which prohibits the impairment of contracts. And the Supreme Court, through a non-originalist interpretation, said that even though the moratorium did impair the obligation of contracts, it didn't violate the Contracts Clause. And my argument is that the judges who signed that opinion hurt themselves because they didn't exercise the virtue of justice as lawfulness. And how do we know that? Because there was nothing in the text, the structure, the history, or the precedent of the contracts clause. In other words, there was nothing in the law in 1934 that would have justified that judges, those judges' decisions. And therefore, it was a new decision, and therefore not based on the law. It wasn't the judges exercising justice as lawfulness. And second, a judge who fails to utilize originalism also harms the legal system because the judge is as har and, and is therefore harming our ability as Americans to coordinate through that legal system. So we had the earlier confirmation hearings of uh, Justice Gorsuch and then Justice Kavanaugh, and the Justice Kavanaugh ones, I don't know, for those of you who watched it, I thought it was a terrible experience. It was kind of watching a train wreck where you, you know it's coming, it's terrible, you can't take your eyes off it. And what made, what made the Kavanaugh hearings or the Gorsuch hearings or the Baird hearings, what makes them so important to Americans today? And I think it's because uh, people on one side of the aisle think that the judge, people, I think many people on both sides of the aisle think that the judges aren't following the law. They're following what they view about abortion or gun control or the size of government. And what that means is that it's crucially important to get your person who is a politician in robes uh, up to the Supreme Court to effectuate their policy preferences. And, and what that does is it undermines the rule of law. It undermines our respect for the uh, Supreme Court, for the judges who were on there, and undermines our, our ability, the Supreme Court's ability to enforce the Constitution. So what I've argued up to now is that originalism, because it identifies the Constitution's solutions to fundamental coordination problems, best facilitates human flourishing, and is therefore the most normatively attractive theory of interpretation. And following originalism is necessary because it effectuates our society's authoritatively established uh, legal norms. Their solution to our coordination problems, which enables each of us today to pursue our own basic human goods. My last point, judicial virtues. I've, met, I've touched on them a couple of times, and I'll just uh, talk about them a little bit more here because of time constraints. So there's lots of judicial virtues out there. I'm just going to focus on two as, as examples. Uh, one is theoretical wisdom, and the other is uh, temperance. So theoretical wisdom, as I mentioned earlier, is, is having the firepower to be able to master an area of the law. And with originalism, it can be really challenging because not only do you have to master the uh, text, structure, history, and original meaning, you also have to master the precedent, both, pre both originalist and non-originalist. And Justice Thomas, in his concurrence in U.S. versus Lopez, is my favorite example of that. Of that. Uh, so for those of you who've covered Lopez, Justice Thomas has a, has a long concurrence where he goes through the original meaning of the Commerce Clause and then the precedent. And I think he, just, he does a masterful job. As a teacher, it's, it's a love-hate relationship. I love it because it's a great example. And I hate it because it takes up a whole class if I want to really give it the justice it's due. On the flip side is Justice Scalia. Justice Scalia is, is, my, is one, a longtime uh, favorite justice of mine uh, uh, for, uh, because of his uh, originalism, but also because of his outspokenness, uh, even his pugnaciousness. Um, but th there are uh, lines, I would say, about uh, uh, how, one, how, one, how one judge's demeanor interacts with other judges. Uh, and for those of you who remember the, who read the Obergefell uh, decision, Obergefell versus Hodges, Justice Scalia dissented. He had a very vigorous dissent, kind of a standard vigorous dissent, but he also had some statements in there that I think reflect judicial intemperance. Uh, for example, uh, Justice Scalia said in a footnote that if he had joined the majority opinion, he would, quote, hide my head in a bag. And that may be a true statement, maybe he would do that, but I think that that was also an intemperate statement, and that's probably something that didn't contribute to uh, the efficacy of his argument. 
So what I've done this afternoon is I've summarized, I think, the three key contributions of originalism's promise, the theory of precedent, the natural law account of originalism, and then lastly, uh, just a very brief amount about the judicial virtues. I'm looking forward to your, your comments, constructive criticisms, and questions.